divergent paths in future reality. Because we can measure the cycling changes of good and evil, what is called karma in the Orient or morals in the Occident, as they occur naturally affecting events in our reality on Earth from behind the scenes, so to speak. We can make predictions about what event will follow from what event if we are presented with an initial more or less optionally binary in nature form of choice to start with. If, for example, we can say X in reality translates to good in the higher dimension, or that Y in reality is worse or more evil and pulled toward the lesser dimension. Within a system where realities X and Y can overlap and are not mutually exclusive, then we can formulate these out to decipher how they would each and all relate to one another over a fixed duration of time. Thus, there is good X and worse X, which is XY, and evil Y and better Y, which is YX. So we can see that in a cycle, these proceed from one to another over a fixed duration, such that X leads to XY, to YX, to Y, and then back the way it came, such that from Y to YX, to XY, to X, and then back again to Y. Now if we can say X and Y are not mutually exclusive, we can formulate two currents braided into one another, such that if one begins on X1, the other begins on Y2 and we may assume they both recycle throughout their respective patterns at the same rate over the same fixed duration. Thus, x1 to y1 to x1, etc. would occur simultaneously to y2 to x2 to y2, etc., and vice versa. Now draw a flat timeline between these intertwining dimensional supersymmetric string dimensions and where they peak and trough, converge and diverge, to and from this middle path occur the patterns formed in our own reality as heaven and hell conflict here over time. So let's start on May 5th, 2000 and end on December 21, 2012. If X1 and Y1 at the start, then Y2 and X2 at the start, and then so forth and so on until the end. Romney wins the Republican nomination. Romney versus Obama equals the New World Order wins. The difference between free market capitalism and revolutionary multinational socialistic communism is, as I say, not in terms of their goal. They both believe they're doing good and attempting to establish an ideal utopia. However, again, as I have said, they have different ways of getting to that goal. The tactics used by free market capitalism, as Ron Paul and the Austrian Economics School define it, include only anti-racketeering laws alone, leaving the rest of all economic business dependent only on sound money, or solid coin currency. The tactics used by socialist communism are far worse and opposed to the tactics of free market capitalism as well. The tactics employed by socialist communism are, as already mentioned, revolution and multinationalism. Under Barack Hussein Obama's administration as U.S. President, we have seen countless nations in the Mideast and Africa overthrow their national government's officials, Countless European and formerly Soviet nations declaring insolvency as their central banks call in their debt. And in the USA, the formation of the homeless Occupy and anti-tax Tea Party movements. All of these activities have been met with a wet blanket response from the U.S. president, who has been busy enough gossiping about green energy this and metrosexual marriage amendments that, while remote-controlled drone bombing them and crossing off enemies from his list. His presidency is defined by the looming shadow of massive tax hikes due to the continued bottomless war chest and the ongoing legislational attempt at state supply-side funded federal-level government mandated universal health care, the universal joke called Obamacare. 
The threat of what he may be capable of during his second term is second only to the threat of a Mitt Romney presidency. Because Mitt Romney is both a Republican and not the incumbent, he has no chance of winning against Democrat incumbent Barack Obama if their platforms are compared. Romney is everything bad ever said falsely about Ron Paul incarnated. He is an unelectable racist and he hates the poor. The pattern over at least the last seven presidents with Ronald Reagan are for two terms following D, Jimmy Carter, then eight-year Bill Clinton D, following one term R, George Bush Sr., then one term D, Obama, following two term R, Bush Jr., infers that in this trend, Obama has the possibility to win a second term also, depending on if he has a weak Carter or Bush Sr. or a strong Reagan Clinton Bush Jr. voter turnout. The New World Order appointed him. He was chosen to take the Democrat nomination over current appointee to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton at the 2008 Bilderberg meeting. So the New World Order may decide his fate. They would very much like to pit him against a weaker candidate from the other party and let him win a second term. Unfortunately, the reality of the situation is preventing them from being able to pull this sham off. The elder members of this rich elite cabal of globalists have got no idea how justifiably pissed off the real people of the world were after the stolen election of 2000 that led to eight years of the autocratic and tyrannical W administration. We will not tolerate either a failure by our government to obey the will of the people of this nation in the 2012 election, nor will we accept the imposition onto our living body of the innate evil of martial law. If Mitt and Obama are the two candidates, then there is no lesser evil. Both equally spell certain doomsday. Both belong to the New World Order, and their plans employ only the tactics of socialist communism. Ron Paul wins the Republican nomination. Ron Paul versus Obama? Liberty wins. A vote for Ron Paul, dead or alive, checked or written in, is a vote to say fuck you to the system. The MSM has made quite a bit about Obama having stolen a large portion of the pre-Y4L era Ron Paul movement's newer converts in the later months of 2008, after Ron Paul conceded, when it looked like the only options to elect for president were either Barack Hussein Obama, Democrat, or John McCain, a warmongering racist bigot Republican for who would follow the, by then, massively unpopular W. Bush administration. Obama was clearly the lesser of two evils against McCain, and he would be again against Romney. However, both in 08, when I wrote Ron Paul in on the ballot, and now in 12, Ron Paul could, can, and God willing will beat Barack Hussein Obama hands down. He does in most statistical data sets when they're polled head-to-head. -head. And more importantly, Ron Paul has already transformed the rhetoric of the Republican Party to a position now somewhat to the left wing of Barack Obama and the modern Zionist APAC-funded Democrat Party that supports him. Ron Paul does not just want peace in our time. He is, and has been for many terms now, demanding peace now. That is bold and daring, and it takes brass balls too big to be busted by even Sasha Baron Cohen dressed up as Bruno, which, by the way, Ron Paul happens to have. The MSM pray around Ron Paul like vultures, and it is our fucking duty as the American people to tell those pricks to go fuck themselves. They are the same stuck-up snobs you didn't like in high school, and now they run your government, own every network on TV, and broadcast their own version of the truth on their cable network news media channels. So whatever happens between now and this coming November, I would urge you, 
whoever you are who might read this by then, to write in Ron Paul on the ballot if you have to, alive or dead. Ron Paul is an idea we can all look up to right now and hope one day to achieve even more than for the same cause. Potential long-term outcomes. Romney, Obama, and Ron Paul all believe they are doing what is good and right and just from their own point of view. Romney and Obama share the same point of view. Both want bigger government and more war. Romney wants to expand the wars and Obama the welfare, but both want the government to go hat in hand begging for that money for their programs to the Federal Reserve privately owned U.S. Central Bank and borrow it. They collect it back from us in taxes, but they fund their programs first. That's the way it goes. Either you think welfare is a lesser evil, or you think that war is for the greater good. There are no compromises on this matter in Washington, D.C. Both parties are backed by the big banks, who are owned and operated as FDIC-insured member banks of the Federal Reserve System of the USA. Both parties advocate the same thing, only using different reasons to justify doing it. Either we want to kill someone, or we want to help someone. But even if the person or people we are killing and funding are the same as with the government and the people of Pakistan being loaned aid to and drone bombs simultaneously, their tactic is to make the government at all levels bigger and bigger by making up new laws and new departments and to pay for it using the Federal Reserve's worthless pretend money. Then the Fed expects to be paid back for their loan of this counterfeit crap, and so the government turns around and takes the taxes out of every citizen's paychecks. Make taxation voluntary. The only way to get money out of politics is to not pay taxes. However, it would be wiser to follow Ron Paul's Restore America Now budget plan. In the first year, he has attritioned out five federal departments and, by reselling the auto industry's private shares bought out by the federal government under TARP and by allocating 100% of the first year's taxes to paying down the federal debt the U.S. government owes the Federal Reserve, he will avoid cutting any of the mainline welfare or warfare departments and manage to balance the budget to zero debt by the end of the first year and the beginning of the second. By tax season 2014, you might not even have to pay taxes. All you have to do is vote Ron Paul. Neo-feudalism under corporate monarchies polluting a collectivist dystopia. Imagine a second term with Barack Obama as U.S. President, Joe Biden as Vice President, and Ben Bernanke as Federal Reserve Board Chairman. Imagine a first term of a Mitt Romney presidency with Rand Paul as Vice President and anyone, even Ron Paul, as Federal Reserve Board Chair. Firstly, I could not imagine Ron Paul accepting that post on the grounds that, to quote myself, if Einstein runs for president of the free world, you don't appoint him head of designing new bombs instead. A vote for either Obama, with whoever is vice president, or for Mitt Romney, even if Jesus Christ himself or his running mate is Veep, is a vote for the same thing, Goldman Sachs, a Wall Street investment megabank. They have donated the majority of their campaign contributions to both Obama and Romney. Both Obama and Romney are two sides of one coin, and this coin is non-refundable. If either Obama or Romney wins, there will be a global economic downturn the likes of which no one has ever seen before on this scale. Breadlines will form in all nations as hyperinflation makes staple goods unaffordable, Revolutions will take place across the planet. In every major city, there will be uprisings against the local governments. Riots and looting will raise all we have worked so long to erect. Massive toxic pollution will occur as the infrastructure for our fossil fuel energy industries begins to rust. 
and eventually plagues will spread from lack of sanitation. New human targeting diseases will mutate. Starvation will overtake many. Some might foolishly seek shelter in the deep underground military bases, the dumbs, or attempt to implement global martial law. It will be too late to save our species, and we might take the entire planet Earth down with us. If either Romney or Obama wins, to quote Gerald Salente, we lose. Libertarian, anti-taxation, pro-gold redistribution, anti-corporatist utopia. What is wealth? Wealth, most agree, is all your property, all your resources. But you would never trade some things you own. Those are your savings, what you want to keep with you. The rest is merely fodder for the ever-circulating free market. Now, among all the rest of your assets that you would be willing to trade from, wouldn't it be great if you had just one thing that you could trade in instead of trading away all your collection of different goods? Well, when they ask you at the grocery store, if you want paper or plastic, and you unthinkingly reply your preference, you should think about the question, what is money? What works best as money? What is the difference between different forms of currency? The matter of gold is too complex to debate here, but suffice it to say there are enough planchette factories now in operation to mint enough gold coins for at least the amount of circulating paper cash currency in the U.S. market by tax season 2014. All you would need to do would be to vote Ron Paul. In a libertarian form of government, the federal level would be reduced to a small system of courts, to quote libertarian Ayn Rand from the now movie and book Atlas Shrugged, and their sole function on that level would be to try financial crimes as treason. Wall Street corporatist racketeering investment bank, Federal Reserve counterfeiting, and lobbyists and campaign contributor insider trading crimes are only a few. Besides the laws applying to high finance in a libertarian and or socialistic communist utopia, there are no laws applying to anyone as individuals. All the economic shackles of sociopolitics would shatter, and the MSM blinders be torn away. Of course, we should all know by now that this utopian vision can be brought about by only one of the two possible ways imagined for doing so. The socialistic communist strategies of revolution and multinationalism will result in a dialectical compromise methodology, a conceptual infinitely repeating halves scenario, whereby their goal of a utopia will never be reached, but will always retreat from their grasp like the horizon on a globe. Only by liberty, by liberation, and by liberating of the free market from the shackles of government regulations written by the rich elite for their own benefit, only then will we be able to achieve the straight and narrow or middle path, the so-called royal road to an anarchist utopia. Most likely outcomes given historical dialectics. Given the New World Order appointed the present incumbent U.S. President, and thus his fate is in their hands, and given that the New World Order is socialist communist in the philosophical composition of its elder members, who encourage their younger groupies to use the tactics of revolution and multinationalism, and given these tactics form a dialectic of incremental compromises until eventually the New World Order's collectivist vision is realized. So, given all these things, and knowing the New World Order is well enough powerful to have Ron Paul killed at any moment, it is possible to plot the most likely scenario from the points of view of either Ron Paul winning the presidency of the U.S., which would be good, or Obama or Romney winning, which would be worse. If Ron Paul wins, his four-year term in office will be just as laid out 
in his Restore America Now budget plan released in late 2011, early 2012. I recommend reading that document if you've had the time to read all this too because it will explain the American way out of this mess we're in. On the other hand, there's the New World Order or globalist way to do things. They will attempt to keep localizing each new bankruptcy as they occur, country by country as they have in Europe. They will keep localizing each new revolution as they occur, as they have country by country in the Middle East. They will keep sending SWAT police teams in to break apart Occupy events in city after city and localize the coverage in the US MSM. The real people are tired of the bullshit and getting more royally pissed off with each passing second. The planet is, for all intents and purposes, a ticking time bomb right now. It can go either way and so far as Obama and Romney are like Lenin and Ron Paul more like Trotsky, as the socialist communists would have you know about. Or you can ignore the MSM and opt out of all taxes and benefits from the federal government just by voting Ron Paul. Gradual scaling down of mega corporations by IRS racketeering busts. Regardless of how it turns out in the general election this November, the big investment bankers know the heydays of 1980s corporate and Wall Street Reaganomics, the heydays of the 2000s George W. Bush era tax breaks and endless war, the Obama heydays of 2008 through 2012 when corporations, Wall Street, and big investment banks got a fat taxpayer-funded bailout. All those heydays of a bull shit market are over and done now. There's no going back to those days ever again now. There is simply no way to continue to spin their web of lies in the MSM beyond this coming December. The corporate special interest lobbyists are going to be purged from campaign donations by some form of new regulation regardless of which of those men are president because it will be pushed for through the capital chambers and public demand for its signing be heightened by the MSM. The get money out of politics meme has already been implanted into the Occupy movement's rhetoric directly by CNBC news anchor Dylan Radigan in a speech he gave using the people's mic or mic check method in their first few months after OWS began in New York City. Radigan guaranteed an assembled crowd of protesters who all repeated his words back to him phrase by phrase as he spoke, that the get money out of politics message was in the pike, and that the New World Order is nothing but wrestling, referring to the WWF's New World Order titled branch. Of course, he was probably just hammered after work and thought shouting at a crowd would help him blow off steam. Nevertheless, the get money out of politics meme has wormed its way into the OWS and even Ron Paul quote bot rhetoric and is being mentioned as a phrase in the MSM. This much is fact, but it may be an attempt to plant a New World Order sided Trojan horse inside the OWS and Liberty Message rhetoric made by the Bilderberg Group, who themselves may at this point be an abandoned shell group as Japan embedded journalist Benjamin Fulford has proposed, while the real elites are holding conferences elsewhere at some other time, as Fulford forwards this June with the White Dragon Group representing the interests of Japan and the Japanese. On March 11, 2011, a tsunami struck Japan, which Fulford has long claimed to have been man-made, ordered by Obama, and broadcast from HARP and which resulted in the ongoing meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. This event, causing radioactivity levels to have risen to double their normal rate in California, USA, Pacific Ocean, coast caught fish, combined with the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and the toxic rust-red iron-rich sludge spill in Germany, have all been ignored by the MSM. Instead, 
uncontainable wildfires in arid Nevada, Arizona, and Colorado, USA, as well as tornadoes and hurricanes along the southern and eastern USA Atlantic coasts, still capture the MSM's attention more. Ultimately, if the New World Order want to allow anything to happen, it can, including their own gradual transition to a more rational policy. Quickening plans in process for implementing a gold coin one world currency. There will be a one world currency. 99% of the population, including 98.5 of the OWS is 99%, and one half of the remaining 1% of the rich elite New World Order, agree it is inevitable. The OWS is 98.5% don't want the one world currency if it includes a world bank to which we all pay taxes. The New World Order's 0.5% want just that. But both the OWS's 98.5% and the New World Order's 0.5% believe the global economy is going to morph into a one world currency sooner or later whether they are for or against it personally. This 99% of the whole are thus totally disempowered in the equation and the only ones left with the balls to even discuss the issue seriously are the remaining 1% who include 0.5% from the OWS side, comprised of real people, and the other one half of the 1% from the new world order of rich elites. So if this other 1%, comprised one half from OWS and one half from the NWO, has done the math on their negotiations, then they still know the only feasible model for a global currency is gold coins because paper cash and digital credit are headed toward a goal the implant chip they can never reach because their collateral resources have all been traded away and not even all their cash or credit in all their empty vaults and computer databases will buy them a loaf of bread in short the result of their attempting to incrementally encroach their technologies into the global marketplace and their other tactics of revolution including economic shock testing of multinational big bank bailouts and their essentially socialistic communist premise of basing global currency on fiat debt rather than on any solid commodity prevent them from achieving their goal they run out of money before they can fully implement their plans. So far, no economy founded on fiat or counterfeit currency has sustained even so long as the present global economy, standardized down to values in U.S. dollars, measured as value depreciating Federal Reserve banknotes, redeemable in bullshit but nothing more. Ultimately, we have to figure out a way to use gold coins as the global currency, and this trick might not be as easy without him around, as Ron Paul makes it look. Least likely outcomes given historical dialectics. If Ron Paul does not win the Republican nomination, even by write-in, if he has been killed by the establishment, or his personality cult discredited. And Mitt Romney, even with Rand Paul, Ron Paul's son, Republican Senator from Kentucky, as his vice presidential nominee. And either Romney or Obama is the next president. Following 2012's election cycle, then this world will end on April 15, 2029, when Apophis strikes planet Earth. Ron Paul already knows about the plans for surviving such an event, being privileged to the daily reports of the CIA as a member of Congress, and being intelligent enough to piece their plans together and make a reasonable prediction for their motives. It is unknown, by me at least, if Ron Paul is aware of the asteroid Apophis's predicted impact date in specific, 
although it is known, by me at least, that this is a pretty obvious secret being kept within the intelligence community who are tuned into NASA, since NASA was complicit in covering the 2029 impact date up with the fake gravitational keyhole scenario story. Perhaps Ron Paul is aware of this, but has simply chosen to believe NASA's false scenario and 2036 potential impact date. Either way, if he doesn't know it, or if he knows about it but it is misinformed by his sources, the result is the same. His patience as a person has allowed him to believe there is enough time for people to prepare to deflect Apophis, or rather to avoid Armageddon and World War III in general, to cure a global economic meltdown, etc., when many, many people would disagree with him about that. Perhaps he is only allowing himself to be used as a political pawn, in some vague hope that it will help the liberty message whose torch he carries. Or perhaps he knows we are all doomed either way, and was only trying to provide a glimmer of hope to the damned, no matter how futile doing so may be. But nevertheless, it is in the period of time between December 2012 and February 2013, which would be the first month of Ron Paul's presidency, that the asteroid Apophis 99942 is closest to Earth and thus would be easiest to deflect from its present trajectory using a short-range probe. It is our best shot at being able to deflect it, and neither Obama nor Romney have the guts to send this mission. They would rather say, do it later. Ron Paul alone would be busy enough working on restoring the U.S. and hence the trickle-down global economy, allowing us to be able to do it later, because under Romney or Obama, that later would never come. The IMF suing the UN for recognition of sovereignty to implement global martial law. Worst case. The USA can and should, but probably will not, regardless of who is US president next, just renege on paying back its outrageous and imaginary debt. It can, simply, dissolve and repossess all the holdings of the Federal Reserve Bank. The Fed has fought long and hard for the Independence Clause in its charter entry in the Federal Register. It is a government-sponsored, not owned, enterprise. This means the government uses the Fed as its sole banker, but that the government can effectively fire the Fed as such and hire any other bank to perform the Fed's duty or even abolish the use of a central bank in the USA altogether. Ron Paul's Restore America Now budget plan represents almost a final chance for the government to abolish its debt and still be allowed to fulfill its duty and obligation in the eyes of the law, without simply declaring federal-level government bankruptcy to the Fed and thus passing ownership over the government's authorities to the private owners of the U.S. central bank. If we, the U.S. people, do not elect Ron Paul, the result will not be lawful and will thus prove much bloodier. If the U.S. government does, as I would say it should, renege on its debt to the Fed and dissolve the institution of a U.S. central bank entirely, repossess its gold and distribute that as their currency, then everything will be the same in the end, but there will not be as bloody a revolution when the Fed rebels against the government's threat to its debt. If the federal-level government of the U.S. defaults on its debt, the Fed will try to collect, but they will not be successful. If the government pays the Fed back and then dissolves their use, the Fed will have no legal recourse to stage any coup attempt at all. The Fed sponsored the creation of the IMF and World Bank, which has served to line the U.S. Fed's pockets on all the IMF's international aid loans. The IMF is to the U.N. what the Fed is to the U.S.A. The G8 and G20 are to the U.N. Security Council 
what the Council on Foreign Relations is to the Federal Reserve. If the IMF is empowered by precedent set in the case of the USA's federal government versus central bank to be allowed by the armies of the world to collect its debt, thus enslaving the peoples of the various nations to taxation, exclusively controlled by and benefiting the IMF. The result is corporatist neo-feudalism. If the IMF is overthrown and its loans taken gratis by all its indentured nations, it will be due to the U.S. defaulting on its debt in any such way as to render impotent the Fed's authority in the USA, due exclusively to their funding the intelligence community's now obsolete black budget. And then the world will not end in a bloody revolution nor in global martial law. It might not even end in 2029 if Apophis's trajectory can still be deflected by a probe before then. If the IMF is somehow successful in collecting its debts from all its indentured nations, it will not matter if they allow Apophis to hit us or not, because they will implement global martial law, and then life will not even be worth living. On the other hand, if Ron Paul gets elected, the Fed will not have any say in its being dissolved, and thus the IMF will never be able to collect its debts by enforcing global martial law. The UN being tried in the world court for complicity in the CIA's Cold War and post-9-11 crimes. Best case. It would be wrong to think of the role of the UN during the Cold War between the USA and then Soviet USSR of Russia as that of referee between these global superpowers. The UN Security Council is comprised of the Allied nations following World War II. But the Allies' first act as the UN was to create the Nation of Israel by supervising a European and American invasion and military occupation, Ashkenazi land grab, of the Holy Lands around Jerusalem from the native largely Bedouin Palestinian Arabic Semitic inhabitants. The goal was to make a place for the Jews. Since that time, the only role of the UN was as a superpower to juxtapose and dissipate all organized opposition against Israel within the Muslim world, the so-called green voting bloc of the General Assembly of the UN. The Muslim world has itself been split into two, and their civil war between Shia and Sunni compressed and heightened by the UN Security Council isolating these nations from foreign relief aid. Gaza, for example, was sent a flotilla of humanitarian supplies via the Mediterranean seaports of Egypt. The IDF stormed this flotilla of boats by night with helicopters and destroyed it. This act, one among thousands, was never reported as a crime to the UN's world court, However, as I have said elsewhere, if the World Court were independent of the UN, they would try the heads of the UN's own Security Council's member nations. If this act were to ever occur, it would usher in a new era of enlightenment and libertarianism, or literal liberty-messaged liberalism. We could easily deflect Apophis and evolve ourselves into a state of conscious super-awareness, even finally achieving contact with other sentient ESP using EBEs. As I have written elsewhere, there are basically two dimensions that supersede our own which are crossing over one another now. In the future of the worse world line, the IMF assumes sovereign control above the UN. In the better future, the UN's Security Council could be dissolved. It all depends on whether the U.S. federal level government or the privately owned central bank of the USA, the Federal Reserve, triumphs in the end. Global Emperor Ron Paul There is another possible outcome, even if the USA federal government ousts their control of U.S. 
popular public opinion from the Federal Reserve Central Bank. And that is if Ron Paul is appointed Secretary General of the UN. I don't have any personal opinions about this option at this time. In my opinion, it would be a coin toss as to whether he was able to implement a gold coin currency either local to the USA as U.S. President or globally as UN Secretary General. Ultimately, it comes down to the question of which is more important to Ron Paul personally, as a libertarian and as the champion of liberty. Would it be better to have a sound global economy based on gold coin currency, or would it be better to attrition out global government? As Secretary General of the UN, Ron Paul could do both, but as President of the USA, he could accomplish both on that nation's local level and thus allow it to lead by example anyway. So it would be better in the short term for Ron Paul to be U.S. President than in the long term it would be if he were U.N. Secretary General. With Ron Paul as U.S. President, he can work to dissipate the effect of the U.N. and to dissolve its relevancy on the global stage of geopolitical theater. This would prove more effective than dissolving the post and the legislature of the UN as Secretary General, but the effect it would accomplish would be nearly the same. It may appear to some that it would be more expedient to place Ron Paul in charge of the existing New World Order than it is to allow him to accomplish its abolition from outside of its inner circles. In all likelihood, it would not be, and whether the coin of chance lands on heads or tails, it's still a coin. The real issue of breaking the Federal Reserve Bank, abolishing central banks in general, and scaling back the practice of savings banks to become investment banks by making loans, let alone charging interest. The real issue should be implementing a gold coin currency and returning the people of this planet away from interference in their personal lives by the USA's federal government. If the liberty message is followed through onto its ultimate extension, it means a world where the laws of society are no longer necessary to enforce with a standing class of armed citizens, police and military, because all of us would be allowed to carry a gun. It would be a society where everyone owned, but no one ever needed to use, a gun. There would be no laws to enforce besides those of commerce against racketeering, forming corporations, or as they were originally called, confidence artists colluding in a conspiracy, against counterfeiting, creation of fiat credit to loan, against price fixing, charging interest on loans, and against taxation, collecting debts using violence. This can be achieved with or without Ron Paul personally, but it cannot be achieved without breaking the current New World Order of elder rich elites who shape and design policy via the independent actions of the CIA, whose black budget is funded by the independent from oversight Federal Reserve. Right now, Ron Paul is simply the only public figure with the balls to stand up against the New World Order.